All right. Uh, welcome to our next talk here. Um, I hope you guys had a little bit of a chance to head outside earlier today because it looks like it's been raining for a little bit and our heat wave hopefully is broken. So hopefully the rest of the day is not going to be as anywhere near as punishing as uh, yesterday was. But our next talk is up here. We got uh, Rick Messier, Messier up here who's going to be speaking about hacking around ICS SCADA. So please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. So, so this kind of started uh, a few months ago. I had to set up some um, training around ICS, not something I had really done much of anything with before. Um, so it was an interesting experience trying to um, figure out how I was going to do training around ICS and SCADA. So put together this um, little talk. The idea here is to set you up so that if you had interest in playing around yourself and understanding a little bit more about how industrial control systems work and communicate particularly over networks, um, you may be able to get up and running a little bit faster. So if you're not familiar, industrial control systems, um, they're really about finding a way to manage physical systems in a digital way. So you've got manufacturing plants, power distribution and management facilities, um, chemical processing, a number of uh, water treatment systems, for example, a number of physical plants require digital management. And so we've got industrial control systems. They've been around for um, quite a while. Um, but they've also got a number of problems, including um, poor authentication. And, and when we get into looking at the protocol that is often used in these systems, you'll see just how little security is actually embedded into it. And a lot of these systems were really never designed to be put in anything other than a room with an operator sitting in front of it. So. As a result, the companies that have implemented these often don't have anything along the lines of um, security policies like maybe changing the default password or anything like that. Then all of a sudden they get this idea of, well, you know, we don't really want to walk into the room to manage these devices anymore. We want to sit at our desktop and keep managing them. So let's just plug them into the network, leaving the default password in place. Um, which opens them up to um, remote attacks, particularly if somebody can get access to the desktop, then they can hop on to um, these other systems. Often there aren't updates, there's very little monitoring. Um, they're also potentially fragile systems. Um, they may be designed to perform a specific function, don't have high power processors in place, so they may be really easy to attack uh, over a network. And they really weren't designed often with networks, and particularly open networks, in mind. So one of the protocols that's used, kind of a de facto protocol for the communicating with these industrial control systems, and one of the elements particularly in an industrial control system is a programmable logic controller. That's the device that that connects directly to the endpoint within the entire industrial control system and manages the physical device. So maybe it's a valve, for example. You want to get a read from the valve, you talk to the program of a logic controller and get the value off that valve. Or maybe you want to open and shut it, and so there's a different communication involved there. So Modbus. Um, came around in the 1970s. It was originally a serial communication protocol um, before we started trying to force it over uh, networks. It's used to communicate with these programmable logic controllers. Now you can do Modbus over TCP IP or, or Modbus over UDP. When you are communicating with a programmable logic controller, what you're communicating with is a coil which will hold a single bit, or you may be communicating with a register, which is 16 bits. And so there are read-only 
registers like an input register. There's also a holding register, which is read-write. Um, and you can see a discrete input is really just a read-only coil. So a TCP IP frame for Modbus includes the transaction ID, and we'll get a look at this um, in a moment when we look at um, Wireshark decode of the Modbus packet. So we've got the transaction ID, the protocol identifier, um, and that would be zero for Modbus over TCP, the length field, the unit identifier, um, which is a single byte holding a slave address between 0 and 255, and then a function code and then whatever data may be associated with it if you've asked for a value to be written out to a register, for example, you would pass the data along with it. So using Wireshark, I pulled a Modbus packet. This is kind of what it looks like, and you can see the transaction identifier um, right there, the protocol identifier, which is zero because we're using TCP, the length, um, and then the use unit identifier as well. So Modbus, fortunately, Metasploit to the rescue. Metasploit actually includes several Modbus related modules, a couple of them here, um, I'm gonna take a look at with you shortly is Modbus Detect, which is really just a scanner that you provide the remote network to the module and it goes off probing whatever port, the default port for Modbus is 502, goes off probing for Modbus responses on whatever port you have uh, indicated. As I said, if you don't set any port, it will just default to the well-known port value of 502. So give it a network, let it go find um, all of the hosts that speak Modbus on that particular network. Once you have found one, now you can start playing with it. And this is one of the challenges, of course, with um, ICS SCADA is we don't all have ICS SCADA devices sitting in our basements and little workshop labs at home. Um, so there is a bit of a problem with that, um, but there is fortunately a solution. But we do have Modbus client. If you do have um, access to or you're doing any sort of testing with a network that may have ICS um, systems on it that communicate over Modbus, you can use the Modbus client to read and write values to the coils and registers. It'll save you a lot of of hassle. So we've got, fortunately, as I said, a solution to the problem of, gee, I don't have an ICS SCADA system, but I want to work with one a little bit. Fortunately, there is a Python module for this um, called PyModbus, and that's what we started using when we were doing, trying to do emulation of Modbus and SCADA systems so that we could do a little bit of training around it. Now, if you want to do any sort of testing um, and play around a little bit with manipulating coils and registers and communicating with it and seeing how Modbus works, you can use PyModbus. This, um, fortunately, they've got um, a number of examples um, on their documentation site. I've pared down um, their server example here and stripped out all of the comments so you can see um, the specifics of how their server works. You can see it's very simple to write one. Really the bulk of this is just setting up the data store and then setting up identity values. Um, you could leave off the identity values if you wanted. Um, the data store just sets up um, a number of registers for you so that you've got a place to read and write values from. Um, and then the real guts of it is just that last line where you're starting up the TCP server um, to be able to communicate with. Now this one is set up to run on localhost. You can, of course, change that localhost value to run on whatever interface that you've got. Um, but you can see how easy this is to, now I've got um, an ICS 
I'm sorry, a Modbus server on my network that I can communicate with. So let's take a look at how we might actually communicate with that. So what I've got here, let's see if I can make that a little bigger for you. So I did, I started off here by just doing a scan of um, my local network on my PC. I've got a, um, one of these Modbus servers running in a virtual machine. And so I just scanned that network and you can see at the bottom there that I came back with, I got a um, correct Modbus header and it tells me the unit ID is one. So I can also find um, unit IDs because every Modbus connection may have multiple unit IDs associated with it and every unit ID may have a number of registers associated with it. So I can now use um, a different can read having to type bend over here. Now I just set my R host here to be 10.37.129.3. Make sure I haven't missed anything. And I can scan particular unit IDs here anywhere from 1 to 254, or the default here is 1 to 254. Uh, I'm just going to run that. In this case, the server I've got set up is going to respond across all of them because that's just how it was configured to do. But you can identify different station IDs once you've found a host. Now you can figure out what unit IDs it's going to respond with. And now we can go back and actually manipulate some values here. There are quite a few options associated with this one, including some that aren't shown here. In addition to the options here, I've got to be, I've got to tell it what I want it to do. So there's an action associated with it. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to set my data to be just a value that we're going to set. And then my data address where I'm going to store it. And we'll just say that's three. I'm going to set my R host and I'm just going to leave the unit number where it is as we saw earlier. It's going to respond across all of them, the server I've got here so I could communicate with any unit number um, that I wanted to. And I should just be able to run this now. So. Now I have just set a value inside one of the registers. And in order to make sure that I get that and that I know that it was written, I can set my action to be read registers. missing something because I didn't get the value back. Oh, right. Thank you. I knew I was missing something. Let's 
So it's write register, but read registers. Oh, you're right. Okay. Right register. Now we're on. <laughs> Thank you. I can't. See, I can't see bent over like this. Okay. There we go. should have just written it out, right? You know, this worked about an hour ago when I did it. Well, oh, I was, didn't I do that? Right, 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 right. There we go. Yeah, right. I was doing registers versus register. Okay, now I can set my action to be read. Anyway, so yeah, and that's my that's just where I'm running the the virtual machine with the um, with the server running on it. So you can use um, you can use PyModbus to run clients. Um, I've written clients using PyModbus um, that do the read and writes back. Um, we did uh, a little just simple script that pulled back um, all of the values within um, the server as just an emulation of uh, a human machine interface um, system. So if you want to play around with um, ICS SCADA systems, PyModbus works pretty well. You can use that to, to emulate. Um, and certainly, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of work to be done um, around securing these devices, um, there's generally no encryption, there's no authentication you know, at the network level. Um, if you send a request um, and you can get to that device, it's gonna respond with the value. So if you wanna do a little bit of work playing around with ICS SCADA systems, um, this is one way to do it. Thanks. Yeah, there's, I think, in terms of the number of devices that are connected to the network, you, you kind of have to pick up the news um, periodically to see that there are a lot of them. There was one um, a couple of years ago, there was an electric company in northern Vermont that they were concerned about um, because their desktop network had been infiltrated and they had allowed their desktop network to get access. 
Um, but it's, it's a big issue with a lot of companies having to um, be better protected about their desktop network because they are starting to plug these in and they're leaving default passwords on. Insecure these are that there haven't been more attacks against them.